Welcome back to Parenting Unpacked. You're here with Dr. Siobhan Kennedy Costantini and Dr. Kristen Summer as we muddle our way through parenthood with evidence, empathy, and common sense. Let's get into today's episode. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. We are so happy to welcome you to our podcast, Parenting Unpacked, here with Dr. Kristen Summer and me, Dr. Siobhan Kennedy Costantini. So today we have a really exciting episode for you. We had on um, our first guest, Candice St. John. Um, Candice has a really amazing background and um, information and evidence and all of that fun stuff. So Kristen's going to give you a bit of a rundown about who Candice is and what she does. So Candace St. John is a mum of one and a public health practitioner who studies the effects of equity, social determinants of health and adverse childhood experiences, aka ACEs, and trauma on lifetime health. So upon having a baby in June 2020, she was taken aback by the unsubstantiated evidence behind most mainstream parenting ideals. Um, Hi, so did Siobhan and I. We've all been very (laughs) shocked. Um, Absolutely. She took to social media to bust myths and support parents to make the best informed choices for their children to thrive. So that's why she joined us, because we all have the same uh, attitude to helping educate parents through science and empathy and compassion. So she was perfect to join us today. Um, So she recently obtained a holistic pediatric sleep specialist certification, and she'll be continuing education in lactation next. So Candace strives to weave in her public health expertise for advocacy and educational purposes and excited and is excited to work one-on-one with families. And this makes a whole lot of sense with the whole pediatric sleep um, consultant. I think she's just done Isla Grace, um, which is uh, like a true gentle approach to sleep. There is no like intermittent responding or crying methods. I know that we can often get misled, but I think that's the course she's just done. Um, And it makes a lot of sense now because her handle on TikTok, which is where I met Candice, is Sleepy Mama Says. So, yeah, she definitely has a keen interest in sleep. Um, She advocates for biologically normal infant sleep like we do. Um, So, yeah, I think it's going to be a really fun episode. I hope you guys really enjoy it. It's a really foundational um, interview that comes with parenting. So yeah, it's going to be amazing. I hope you enjoy it. Let's flick to the episode. Hello, Candice. Welcome to Parenting Unpacked. Hello. Hi, thanks for having me. (laughs) Oh, I'm so excited to have you on today. I, we felt like you're our first guest on Parenting Unpacked and your expertise is such a fundamental and foundational part of parenting that I think gets overlooked. So I'm so excited to have you here to help us lay some really important foundations for parenting. So do you want to maybe introduce what it is that you think about in terms of public health and motherhood and why it's so important to build like good solid foundations for parenting? Oof, it's a loaded one, but I'll, I'll try to keep it brief. <laughs> um, so as you, as you know now, I'm Candace St. John. Um, I hold a master's of public health and um, I've been working in the field of public health, specifically in community health for the past five years. And um, it's been, honestly, I think working in community health helped me um, a little bit actually prepare for motherhood in a sense, coming from academia, just because when you graduate, I'm sure a lot of us, um, anyone, when you you know get out of any kind of graduate program, you're an expert, right? You have all of this this information, and you know best practices, and all of the data driven strategies, evidence based, right? But then you go to community, and it doesn't quite work like that, right? Top down approaches. Do we know how well those work <laughs> in community? They don't. Just FYI. Right in theory. <laughs> right in theory. <laughs> It's like it's it's helped me reimagine. It it was quite the learning curve, and it, I did it. Um, I work at a small community hospital, and we had to really sit down and reassess our own biases. Of you know, we have expertise, but that doesn't mean we are experts of everyone's lives. We have to use our expertise as a tool. So so for me, um, obviously, I've had a lot of. Uh, a lot of learning in these past few years. And then uh, uh, upon becoming a parent, I um, just saw some of these challenges that my community members face. Um, 
and I come from, you know, a point of privilege in that, you know, I have a decent steady job and um, a lot of other things, you know, steady food, all sorts of other things in my favor that I still was completely uh, rocked by new motherhood. And a lot of it really boils down to kind of that, that, little bit I was talking about at the beginning, this um, idea of expertise and how we kind of wield that. People who are professionals and how are we helping parents navigate this um, this new uh, you know part of our lives as we enter into this new chapter. And um, I'll go into other things as we as we chat in terms of um, just like barriers to our health and um, and barriers to our parenting. But um, just like fundamentally like having accurate information that is provided in a compassionate way, I think is just um, one of the most important things that we can do for parents to help um, remove the barrier of them feeling inadequate in their parenting, right? Um, And I think that is like a really great place to start because a lot of us are, for lack of better words, born with a set of tools that we have. you know, to be able to parent effectively. And um, uh, because we have all this information and knowledge now, we don't trust it at all. Um, So it kind of can lead, especially for, you know, medical and public health professionals to have this really um, kind of like heavy influence on parenting and uh, parenting decisions. And, you know, obviously there is importance to it, but we need to make sure we are um, you know, uh, paying attention to that balance. So that's kind of an overview of my kind of stance on like public health and parenting and where I'm kind of going with this, because I don't think a ton of people talk about it because just like Kristen, like you said, a lot of people don't even think about public health anyway. <laughs> um, but it's, it's really, it's really everywhere. It's everything, um, that we do. And it's often overlooked because it's hard to measure because we're trying to keep people from being sick in the first place. Right. So, so yeah, that's, that's my first rant of the, of the hour. <laughs> that's brilliant. And I think, um, you're so true in that sometimes, um, more information, can be a disservice to us insofar as there's this Socrates quote that I think sums it up perfectly is that true knowledge exists in knowing that you know nothing. So the more we learn, the more we realize what we don't know and then the more we question our judgment, which is beneficial like when it comes to like the big theoretical philosophical questions of life. But when it comes to raising a child, you don't have the time to wax lyrical about all of the theories about how and why things should happen because you, there's too many variables as and I wonder like presumably you guys can all relate to this as academics but we're used to like nutting down the variables and answering the questions and children don't work like that because there are way too many variables and you can control so few of them so it's like learning to be really flexible and learning to try and manage which is a challenge for anyone let alone when you have all this information you're trying to filter it and I mean, this affects all parents at the moment, right, with the internet. You can type in any question you have and you get a thousand answers um, as to what you should or shouldn't be doing. And I would guess, like, at least for me, that's definitely why, like, Instagram spaces um, have been beneficial to me and my parenting is because I can, like, isolate or, like, pinpoint people that I trust and then work with their information rather than Dr. Google helping me try to manage things. And, and honestly, I'm. Oh, sorry, Candace. No, and I'm so happy that you mentioned that because um, the Dr. Google uh, comment, because especially, especially in the baby world or infant and childhood world, when you Google do any key term, it's not evidence based anything that comes up. It's no. whoever has a platform and has the right, um, what is it, SEO? Is the yeah, search and or who, op- whoever's paying the most yeah. to get the answers at the top. There's, I, um, I don't know the specifics, but I know that the sleep training industry, uh, um, like lots of the kind of, um, uh, what's it called, certification um, mm-hmm, programs, mm-hmm. a big chunk of their learning is in marketing and learning how to best oh. market yourself on Google and what, where to pay the money to get the search terms so that when someone types in, why won't my baby sleep, you come to the top. 
<laughs> so this, I mean, this fits in perfectly, right, Candice, with public health and trying to get the information out there. And it does. And it's one of these things. It's actually so one of the things that I do in my current role um, as, as a um, uh, community health epidemiologist is kind of what I do. Um, so it's more of like an applied epidemiologist. I did have to do COVID stuff um, at the beginning of the pandemic, helping um, when you have a small hospital, you have to like really shift your roles. And because I have the skill set, I had to help um, like track our cases in our community before we could get our, our uh, health system set up the right way. Um, but I digress. What I normally do is looking at chronic health indicators and how do we, um, have like public health programs that work around that in our community that are kind of, um, working with our community partners and all that. But one of the biggest things I'm charged with is, um, doing, uh, like community wide survey. I help facilitate that. I help with the, the survey questions and all of that. And you wouldn't believe how many people rely on like social media and like Google or just, their friends and family for information as opposed to their doctors or like actual experts for the subject matter, um, which there is definitely like, uh, I'm not trying to knock it, especially now, because that was one thing I did say, uh, you know, when we were doing this survey um, more recently, I said, you know, we have to, I think that it's not enough to just ask like necessarily social media or, or, um, it, as in the, and kind of clump it in this negative category because some people might be following high quality folks that they never would have otherwise had access to on social media. I was like, it's kind of, um, you know, obviously a blessing and a curse, right? Um, there's some really bad information out there, but there's some really great information for free that people have access to, which is awesome. So, so it's just like this fun, uh, juggling act. As, as as we all know, in, in our ever-evolving, just globalized economy and lives, right? Um, and, you know, internet lives. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I'm happy you brought that up because it's just one of those things that is such an interesting concept to think about um, for, for parents and for, for all of us, really. Yeah, wow. So I actually have a question tracking back a little bit to what you said at the start. Mm -hmm. You were talking about how there's kind of this mismatch between sometimes what doctors share and public health advice. Um, and I think for a lot of people, um, saying the word public health might be a bit opaque. So can you give us a concrete example of a public health initiative um, and how this is kind of at odds with what um, experts are um, pushing parents towards? So things like doctors who might have like a small unit on it in their very original training um, and now like they're very outdated in terms of where the current scientific knowledge and public health initiatives are at. So uh, just a quick and easy one um, in terms of uh, public health initiative or at least public health um, knowledge I guess is if you look at the AAP and we're talking about safe infant sleep I know that I've talked to Kristen about this before, um, but in 2016, they actually didn't update um, because uh, what they had found was having uh, like absolutes, you know, no bed sharing. That's what I'm referring to in this um, in this little portion wasn't working out. Like if you say don't bed share ever, I mean, it's just like abstinence only sexual education that doesn't okay like people have an urge they're still going to do it like sleep is spontaneous it just happens like and the other thing is it's um i, I mean i'm gonna just totally go on a tangent and if i keep going so i'm gonna i'm gonna reel myself in but um but it, when we think about this 2016 they had an update to um i believe if you look in their policy statement it's like policy statement like four e and f or something um i should have brought it up but uh they specifically outline the conditions by which that make bed sharing more dangerous. And um, they have it in there. I would say that they didn't do a great job in because this is one of my kind of qualms is that I wish that they did more in terms of public health and in, um, initiative of um, changing language a little bit and in terms of making it a little less like don't do it, but here's what makes it more dangerous. It's like, you can say, you know, be a little bit more understanding, compassionate in your language. But here's the thing is it, I don't think they have like educated providers on this because I know personally as a mother, I went in and I've had two different pediatricians that have said, you know, no bed sharing. And I said, well, in the 2016 policy brief update from the AAP who, you know, 
provides policy guidance for, you know, medical providers, pediatricians in our, in our um, United States of America, um, you know, it says that it happened. So I think you guys need to consider shifting your language around this because just saying abstinence only, just saying don't do it, just say no, like just say no to drugs. That's another awful one that didn't work and we don't do it anymore. Like there's some things that it just, it just doesn't work. So why would we, why would we push that? We know that it just, you know, sleep just happens to people. So instead of shaming them, empower them with the most information possible to keep baby safe er, you know what I mean? So I'd say that's one, one example, but I, I just named a few just by going on my little rant there, just like, you know, abstinence only sexual education. Obviously now we have, you know, birth control that we talk about. We talk about using condoms, um, all sorts of other, um, uh, initiatives. If you think about drug, um, substance misuse disorder, um, there are, uh, they used to say, you know, just say no to drugs. Now we're looking at programs that have safe um, injection stations because instead of shaming people, we were saying we care about you and we want to make sure you don't, um, you know, we understand that you're suffering from a substance use disorder. It's something that is almost beyond your control at this point. So we want you to do it as safe as possible so you don't acquire other, you know, infections, diseases along the way. And then we're, you know, going to have resources available to you there for when you're ready to make that next step. Because that's the other thing is you, you like can't force people to, um, to do big life changes like that, especially things that are like physiologically based, you know what I mean? So those are just a few examples. <laughs> I couldn't help myself. <laughs> no, that's so many, right? <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. 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 And like, I think, um, I think the bed sharing is a huge one on social media. So, um, it, I went viral on TikTok pretty much for the second time. The first time was my postpartum depression and anxiety video with my husband. And the second time I went viral was the one where the majority of my following found me because they seemed to resonate with me as a mother with a PhD in child development who admitted that I bed shared and didn't mm -hmm. sleep train because one of them felt right to me and one of them felt inherently wrong. And I am so infinitely grateful that the public health initiative in Australia was more progressed than um, in America and with the American Academy of Pediatrics because mm -hmm. our, like, SIDS website actually said, look, bed sharing isn't ideal, but here are the ways that you can make it safer. And when I was still pregnant, I went to a breastfeeding course and they shared what they call the safe sleep seven. I know that Americans have a bit of a problem with that term. They feel like it's not okay to use, but that's what it's called in Australia. And they taught us that. And I was taken aback. I was shocked. I was so insulted that they would share that and <laughs> encourage bed sharing. But then I became a mother and it saved our lives because I was given this knowledge that I didn't think I'd ever need and then one night I needed it because I was falling asleep with my baby in my arms and that is a far more dangerous situation than setting up a safe sleep space for my four-month-old and I and that was it was truly a life-saving thing that happened so I'm really grateful to Red Nose Australia and to the Australian Breastfeeding Association for taking on that public health initiative and really thinking through it. And I think this is really important for so many different initiatives. And a lot of people think, well, you know, um, this wasn't used, to, this didn't used to be the advice. So why do we trust this advice if we no longer trust the old advice? And it's because science is forever evolving. We're forever learning how humans work. We're forever refining and tweaking it. So of course the advice changes. We had the back to sleep campaign, which has saved a lot of babies' lives. But now let's do back to sleep in a safe space based on a whole host of factors that is moving with different families and different circumstances and things like that. Um, yeah, it's definitely a tricky one. I know you faced a bit of backlash for that too, Candice. Oh. Um, <laughs> yeah, problem, especially. You, oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. No, no. You say the problem um, as you outline, Candace, with abstinence only or like just say no, with all of the examples you mentioned, is that once you do do it, once you do bed share, once you do have sex, um, cool, What? where's the support, where's the help, where's the education? It's almost like the messaging is like, oh, well, you're lost to us, good luck. And then we just wait for the next round. 
But then there's all these people that maybe they've maybe they only bed share twice in their lives, but they just think that okay, I'm 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 out of the fold. I don't have any information, and my doctor doesn't want to talk to me because I was I didn't follow the advice. Yeah, you know I I totally agree, and I think there's a lot of people like that because I was a people like that, and I am a person who uh, is in public health, right? I um. I had a pretty close relationship with my own pediatrician, um, who we worked at the same institution and, um, we had butt heads a little bit too, once I shared, because I was like, you know, thankfully I learned more before I was just sharing it because I know there's other people who maybe aren't able to sift through the information. Like I do, I have different level of training and I also, um, look to scientific consensus, right? This is something that we don't really have scientific consensus on, like for the American Academy of Pediatrics to act like, um, or pediatricians in general to act like it's this like absolute when it's absolutely not. If you look at UNICEF, you look at, uh, I believe who even, um, you said red nose in Australia, there's over in, um, in England, the NHS even, um, shares information. Then there's other organizations over there, um, that are, you know, huge advocates besides, you know, like, um, La Leche League, the, the Sa- Safe Sleep 7, and besides, like, James McKenna, who has just, you know, dedicated his whole life, because I don't like to, um, love his research, and I will always look to consensus over person, because that's just, like, in science, that's what you should do, you know, <laughs> um, though I think his work is brilliant, um, and it's, you know, um, it's exactly what you're saying, though, you know, we, we exile people who mm. are all right, you know, you know what you, you messed up. So now you're just, you're just one of them. And it's like, well, I'm not like, cause I'm a whole human with complex, um, you know, <laughs> you know, just like I'm complex. I'm a person like everybody has, you, it, they, they, people are so quick to like put people into camps when y- there's just so much more to life than just, um, you know, separating people into like black and white boxes. And, um, and that's the other thing is like, after I, you know, I have very similar um, story as Kristen, where it just happened. And I was like, literally following the AAP, like, because I went to the policy statement, and I'm looking, okay, these are the most dangerous situations. So like, I'm sitting up in my bed, and I'm falling asleep. That's so dangerous. In my tall bed. That's so dangerous. Like, You know, like there were so many things that they don't have because they don't, you know, discuss it in their policy brief that I was like, great, well, now I'm one of them because like that's that's how we're all like classified if you bed share Um, and no one's going to listen to me. And I'm like, I don't know how to stop myself from falling asleep because I'm really, you know, dedicated to wanting to breastfeed my child and I'm not getting support. And like, what do we do? What are we doing about this? So that's when I started to dive into what is everyone else doing in the world? Because I feel like this is just, like, if I'm falling asleep, I can't be the only person falling asleep. And if so many people bed share, like, this must be, like, some sort of norm. Like, is this what, how people sleep? Then I'm like, that's how animals sleep. This must be how we sleep. We're animals, you know? Like, <laughs> so that's kind of how I um, dove into all of this. But absolutely, that's why I I am so passionate about this. Because once you do it, you're like, all right, well, I guess screw me then like I'm not getting any help because I can't tell anybody about it because I'm just gonna get the lecture and if I could get a vaccine to keep myself from falling asleep I freaking would have but I Mm. couldn't do that you know like I would have done anything to keep myself awake but I couldn't like I just couldn't so how do I do this safer like like instead of shaming people just like surrender to the fact that like you're doing your best and this is what we this is how we can keep it as safe as possible, you know? So that's, that's my whole <laughs> feelings on it. Yeah, no, that's mm. perfect. And I think um, this is a contentious topic. So I think we'll move on from bed sharing. I mean, I purposely <laughs> brought us down that We could talk hole. about it forever. I, I think that I did, actually. <laughs> I think we did it together. I, I, I said a leading question. It's fair. Anyways, we mm. all share blame. But... I want to delve into something that I actually didn't know a lot about until recently that you are an expert in, and that's talking about adverse childhood events, because you have a lot to say about this and a really beautiful resource to share, and it really helps contextualize 
parenting within the scope of how children experience their childhood and how that affects them as adults. So please give us an overview of what, um, is it ACEs is and how yeah. it affects so ACEs are um, basically, uh, so adverse childhood experiences are basically what they sound like. It's, um, there's a, like a list of 10 experiences that have been um, used and proven to show that they will, um, there's a very high probability that if you have, um, you know, one to 10 of these, you will have, um, you know, X percent chance of different health outcomes um, and even a reduced life expectancy if you experience these before your 17th birthday. So it's zero to seven or 18th birthday because zero to 17 years. Um, so I'm like I said, I'm not, by no means like an expert in this. Um, in my role in community health, <laughs> we um, we look at things, um, social determinants of health. That's like our kind of our bread and butter. But we realize that it's more than just social social determinants of health, um, like our built environment, um, social context, healthcare access, things of that nature. But there's equity and trauma that also play huge roles in the social determinants of health because um, they all it's if you can think of them almost like a circle, they all feed into one another um, because, you know, if, if you are, um, you know, say a young person parent like you end up becoming a parent very young you're going to already be at a high likelihood of not being able to generate a high income because you probably won't be able to finish school um educational attainment is another um social determinant of health um it directly correlates as we know to um you know high, the higher level of education you have is the um you know higher uh, or better uh, health outcomes that we have and higher uh, income that we have at least traditionally um so and then when you have all of these external strains and pressures on your life right if you're um unable to uh make a decent living you have to work more for lower wages um you have to put your child in child care um that costs money so there you go there's more money um coming out of your uh wallet um if you had a child like very young say you were uh, like a teenager um they're sometimes is a likelihood that you experienced these adverse childhood experiences yourself. Um, and then you kind of end up perpetuating the cycle of, so if you are strained for resources and all of these other factors, um, you're going to be more likely to then um, kind of pass that trauma onto your child because it's an automatic response. And I'm not a neuroscientist. I'm just super interested in, it. I hold a bachelor's in psychology from, you know, forever ago. <laughs> um, but it's something that is really important. I mean, our automatic responses, what we have in adulthood are, as you both know very well, are completely um, based on how we were parented. Because when you're a child, your your parent is your whole worldview. Your whole worldview is your, your parent. And people sometimes get upset when I mention this, but it's it's just true. I mean, it's not to shame, it's to inform because adverse childhood experiences um, can really, you know, just, it causes generational trauma. Like it just passed on and passed on and passed on until someone, you know, decides to do something about it. And I really talk, it's really a challenging topic to talk about because in the United States, this was back in 2008 when they did this really big study. So it's a bit of a dated statistic, but I can guarantee it's, if it's not the same, it's probably worse. Um, but 61% of folks experienced at least one adverse childhood experience in the United States. Um, and, and adverse childhood experiences, these can range from your parent struggled with substance use disorder, your parent was um, ever uh, in jail or in prison, your uh, parent struggled with mental health challenges. Um, it could be that you experienced neglect, abuse, violence, um, and there's something uh, if you're one of your parents attempted or did die by suicide is another. So all of these factors really play a huge role in our lives. Um, and um, like I said, it, I should bring up um, some of these, some of these statistics, but it's quite uh, shocking to see how substantial the, um, these uh, really affect our lives. So 
and like I said, it's, it's, it makes people like stop and say like, Oh, like you, you're saying this and now I don't know what to do because I feel like a terrible person. Cause I snap at my kid all the time. Or, you know, I've been doing this, this way. Um, I know that some Kristen, you've talked about spanking before I, I know on TikTok, and that usually gets a lot of, um, heat, but, um, it is one of those things where it's like, um, it's challenging because I think, you know, say you don't have a lot of money, you don't hold uh, like a high degree, you don't have a great job, and you only have, you know, a certain amount of food in the house. So when you're a kid, you know, when you talk about gentle, respectful parenting, and you have a kid who's, you know, knocking food off their tray, that can cause you to be triggered, not only because you likely experienced poverty as a child, but because like you literally don't have any other food. So that is extremely alarming to you, but it does cause alarm in your body. So it's really hard for some people to disrupt these cycles. And, and I think it's important to note that if we can hold compassion for these people and there are like small strategies that we can do to help them help you know interrupt these cycles but it's so much more than that like a lot of my work is policy like we need policy change we need to keep people from having to be in these dire situations in the first place i'm just rambling so i'll stop there you let you guys ask more questions (laughs) not at all i think this is all brilliant and i think you're totally right like Obviously, Kristen and I come at it from the research perspective. You come at it from the policy perspective. And so many of us are literally in the people perspective. So it's like, as you rightly identify, this is a systemic issue that parents are now more than ever expected to do more with less, especially mm-hmm. during COVID. Like, um, well, Kristen uh, and I, I don't know. Uh, how old is your son, Candice? He's, what is today? He's about 18 months old now. Yeah, so you, abs- I mean... You've probably been more affected than, I mean, definitely in North America, you've been more affected than we have by COVID. And uh, Kristen and I struggled. We gave birth to our little ones a few months before the first lockdown. So Mm. you would have been in lockdown um, going to hospital appointments. And Mm -hmm. I mean, no one has experienced this kind of stuff in our lifetime. Like, Mm -mm. I mean, what Spanish flu was the last big pandemic and the world was a very different place back then. So we have been charged with being responsive attentive engaged emotionally available um, financially like supportive like we need to be on connected and yeah compassionate parents at all times with no support we're expected to breastfeed we're expected to do baby limb weaning we're expected to do all of this whilst not sharing a bed or a space with our child for eight hours a day like how how none of this is possible we can't do all of these things so, which is why, why the systems need to be put in place, which is why policy is so important. Because if we don't, if we have all these messaging and we are literally incapable of meeting these messages and then when we share with our pediatricians or our doctors that we're struggling, there's not the infrastructure to support um, perinatal mental health issues. There's certainly not the infrastructure to support the fact that you can't do all these things. It's actually impossible. So, of course, parents are burnt out. They're left feeling frustrated they're left feeling incompetent incapable um and despondent and then told well <laughs> you're ruining your child figure it out so right. yeah it, we're, we're in a we're in a very troubling space yeah absolutely Kristen it looked like you were about to say something well the worst thing is that we're living in a social media time as well so we've got this perfect yeah. parenting narrative so they're expecting us to be perfect parents outwardly no one's showing the real life aspects of parenting no one's showing us that it's okay to fail experts and doctors and things are just telling you what not to do or to Mm. do things that go completely against your very biology and the biology of your Mm. child um you're watching scientists on tiktok argue um, yes. as we do, <laughs> like we can't seem to stop that. And it's just, it's impossible because no one is acknowledging that we are humans that have feelings. We're now like pushing children like to the forefront saying children actually have feelings. And that's amazing that we are moving away from this old school narrative that children should be seen and not heard. And we're, we're bringing in like 
infant and child mental health, this is so important. They have feelings. You need to now respond in this way, in this way, in this way. And I share this information too. But what we don't do and what I'm trying to do is to make sure that parents know that they also have feelings, that the reason they yell isn't because they're a bad person, but it's because they're feeling dysregulated. They don't have enough rest. They don't have enough help. They don't have enough time. They don't have enough support for the kind of neurological capacity that their child is experiencing. There is so many things. And then they're living in this social media world where everyone else seems Mm. to be doing everything perfectly Mm. and all of a sudden their mental health is completely destroyed because they feel like a failure they feel completely ostracized from the perfect Mm. parent group and they can't find their own parent group because we live in a lockdown world so we can't even Mm. find our own community Mm -hmm. and it's just impossible like yeah we're trying to be perfect parents in a really not perfect world with absolutely no empathy uh, and where do we go? You're so here? right. You're so right, Kristen. And like so often I see, I, I don't often engage in these like Facebook mom groups, but I am part of them because I'm curious about the discourse that's happening out there. But yeah, mm-hmm. people go in, they ask for help. They say, I'm really struggling. And there's lots of responses about you need to X, Y, and Z. I think your child has autism. I think today. And like there's just this piling on and these poor people are they're reaching out for help because they have nowhere else to go because they don't have access to their villages. And I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm part of the problem. So like on my Instagram page, I share, like you need to build your support network. You need to have a village because that's the only way you can manage. But of course, a huge part of the problem is, and like it was part of my own mental health struggles when um, in my postpartum period is that my son was 12 weeks old when we entered our first lockdown. And I remember thinking we'd moved back home from overseas to be with family and I remember just crying on the bathroom floor saying my village is here I just can't get them like I have a village I need my village I'm not allowed to have them it was really really heartbreaking and this is the case for millions of people all around the world I have friends who um, live in Australia but have family overseas and well before they had children years and years before they had children there were plans that the mother mother mother-in-law would come visit come stay for months they bought houses with spare bedrooms with this in mind and there's just Mm -hmm. it's not possible so it's obviously COVID is no one's fault we're all managing the best we can but and like it's not just parents that are struggling the world is struggling mental health issues are through the roof suicide rates are through the roof um we need to let's let's we need to find a way to pick this up because this is sad and depressing. We're telling everyone yeah. what they already know. <laughs> yeah, but I think that but it's important to to talk about it. Yeah. And that's the thing that's hard. It's hard. Yes. And this is my my job. <laughs> like when you're saying it's depressing and I I I feel like my job is like heavy in that we have to hear it. I mean, a lot of what I do is I'm trying to hear the voices of lived experience so I can help figure out how how do we move forward I mean I mean just speaking from I mean I I know we wanted to kind of move forward from that but I know in America in the United States we um, obviously we only have lockdown for a very short period of time um, because obviously there was a lot of backlash but I think it was also you know again it's like that abstinence only messaging where people realized it's we're still human beings. We have a lot of complex needs. So how do we reduce the risk as much as possible? Which I was really happy to see that. It's like, okay, mm. people need interaction. So like, let them eat outside together. People need interaction. So let's tell them like, you know, open windows. Like not everyone can get a HEPA filter in their house. Okay. Like that's very expensive. Open windows or, you know, gather outside or wear a mask, you know, hand hygiene, don't share drink. Like, you know, like there's, there are things that we can do to help, um, you know, make a village a little bit more available. But I, I know for me, uh, it was still, um, it was still so hard. I mean, because a lot of people, you know, they start living life again, and then you have to start doing risk calculations, right? In your head, where you're like, do I want that person's help? <laughs> like, mm-hmm. like, this person is actually willing to help, but do I want their help? <laughs> you know, so it's hard. It's like, you have all of these layers. And then there's people that have no choice, but to go back to work. And, put their children through questionable um, exposures because there's no other choice and it just, it's hard to navigate it all. So right now it's just like a particularly challenging time. So I can only imagine what ACEs will look like in the future Mm. from this period. Um, 
and and I think a lot of it just like you you both were talking about was you know with social media too where it's like you get to when there's periods like this um it really highlights the differences between um people who are thriving and those who are struggling um and then it's plastered all over the internet you see these people that are like posting things like oh and by the way <clears throat> you know watch you're letting your kid watch tv for any amount of time is ruining their life completely um with, where this person was like oh i finally got it you know what i mean they're like i finally got it i got it together like i didn't snap at my kid today because i let them watch tv for 20 minutes like we need to think of the whole picture like that's what in public mm-hmm. health we we th- see things from up here so there's some like alarmist things that go on it's like yeah of course like we've known for years that of course screen time isn't great but we're also not going back to the stone ages like we are a global society our children need to know how to use technology if they want to mm-hmm. function in society so like mm-hmm. there's all these costs benefits that we need to weigh you know like no if you're letting your child like when i was a kid when i was a kid i was raised by a television am i socially awkward because of the television probably not it's probably because all the other things that happened to me as a (laughs) child like i had a lot of really (laughs) shitty things happen but it's not i'm sure the tv was the best part of my day because i wasn't getting bothered you know what i mean like i wasn't bothering anyone and i was out of the way so again risk benefit i think it was in the favor of the tv and it you know Mm -hmm. that's where people miss things completely when they when we when we assess risk right um so it's just really interesting but but yeah i I, i'm really curious to see what it's going to look like down the road because again so many mixed messages and uh with this movement and again it's like a movement of gentle responsive parenting when actually if you think about it it's like a more um like indigenous and um Mm -hmm. traditional way of human up bringing right human rearing right Um, child rearing um so it's just really interesting because that's like a whole other layer i could (laughs) have a whole other episode about like equity topics Mm -hmm. on um child rearing right and how so many things are quite racist in 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 design and how we like from bed sharing to baby wearing to um how we raise our children right um that have been deemed like bad mainly by white males in the past like in the <laughs> what 40s and 50s 60s time frame but they didn't raise their own children <clears throat> they yeah. were busy <laughs> sitting at the university not being at home with their children so anyway yeah that's a whole other topic yeah so this is like i think it was really important to talk about how hard it is for everyone just because we know it doesn't mean that we shouldn't talk about it we want people to feel seen And until someone talks about why it's so damn hard to be a parent, you don't feel seen. You feel like you're going this alone. So I want everyone to know that we see you, we hear you, and this is a very hard time to live. And even if you started raising your children before COVID, it was still hard before COVID. We are raising children in the most challenging way possible. Being a gentle, responsive, authoritative parent is the hardest thing to do because you're also Mm -hmm. doing it alone. So we see you we hear you and we're living it with you absolutely and just like you had mentioned at the beginning the number story.org is what you wanted me to mention and it's just it's just a a great um website if you want to go check it out um there's a little quiz you can take so you can be aware of your own adverse childhood experiences it's again it's a sliding scale of one to ten but what i appreciate about it compared to things that i've seen in the past is it gives you something to do with that information it's not like oh, wow <laughs> like i'm really messed up <laughs> it's like okay you know your number isn't you your number doesn't define you here are some resources here's more information to learn i love the way in which it presents information it's super compassionate just um highly recommend checking that site out because i just think it's it's like eloquently laid out um and can really help just like you know we're talking about today is just really help you understand why you are the way you are um maybe encourage you to go to therapy if you have access to that but if not it does give you like at least understanding why you're do you know acting a way that you are um that is usually a first step of helping to interrupt that Um, maladaptive pattern right because now the next time you do it you're gonna think like oh 
Like I'm doing that because that happened to me when I was, when I would cry as a kid, I used to be, you know, spanked or something when really I just needed, what did I need? What did little like Candace Mm -hmm. need? Um, So it helps to really um, help interrupt your, your, you know, thought processes. And um, again, it's not like it's, (laughs) it's a cure all site. And again, it stinks because in the United States, there's a lot of healthcare access issues, social determinant of health, um, whether it be lack of insurance, whether it be you don't have transportation to get there, you don't have childcare <laughs> to um, be able to, uh, you know, drop them off and go. Um, and even telemedicine, we thought it was like going to be this great um, cure-all during the pandemic and then we realized like in my region specifically a ton of people don't have like broadband internet we have terrible internet access so people can't even connect with loved ones you know what i mean like during the pandemics never mind their uh healthcare providers so there's just so many layers to all of this and i think that it, talking about it is important because i think at least it helps people feel seen and then i think that can help the movement of you know think about who you're voting for think about like the policies that are in place, think about what are your values? What are things that you wish that we could, you know, have, you know, even if you're not um, thinking about anyone but yourself, right? <laughs> like, because I think some people forget that. Um, and it's not talked about, you know, like, uh, I think a lot of times people don't talk about it because it's, it's, it's either hard or um, maybe powers that be think it's easier to keep things the way that the things are. <laughs> So we don't want to talk about things. And um, yeah, that's kind of where, where I'm coming from. So I feel like I'm in this like, this like little like fighting pit or something <laughs> and uh, with my little teeny megaphone that like, will anybody hear me? Like, yeah. <laughs> please. Well, we hear we gotta... you and we're, we're giving you a platform, but also I'm going to go on a slight tangent right now because yeah. I want to bring this around to some really positive things that we can yes. do because we've told you all the things that mean that your child could be affected later in life. What the hell am I supposed to do with that? It's already happened. What am I going to do? And I'm already ruined how do i fix this and so one that you touched on i think is really important and needs to go further in depth is that you need to show compassion for yourself Mm. you need to reflect on what you experience and how you can move forward so although it sounds like something that's really simple and little this is actually the most impactful thing and i think we touched on this in the um episode we did on postpartum anxiety The simple fact of acknowledging you have anxiety takes the power away from it. So Mm -hmm. simply acknowledging that something happened to you in your childhood, that it wasn't your fault. It wasn't your parents' fault because they were probably following this intergenerational cycle as well. Uh, And acknowledging that you can do things differently and it doesn't Mm -hmm. matter when you start, it's never too late is it takes the power and the negativity away from it because humans have such a negative swirling of thoughts in their brain at all times and we need to work on reducing those negative thoughts and showing ourselves compassion and understanding helps us do that so just because you were hit as a child doesn't mean that you will hit your child you're not broken you're not ruined it's not it you have the capacity to get better and the first thing you need to do is show yourself compassion you need to constantly check in with yourself how am i doing what do i need what kind of support can I reach out for? And this is going to be really tricky for people in like your lower socioeconomic status kind of area with no support. And that's really sad, but I'm hoping that there is some kind of policy or resources that we can pop into our show notes that might be able to help guide you. In Australia, we have a ton of resources. We have a really good um, social support system. We have Medicare, where everyone gets free health. We have free therapy for 12 sessions a year. We have so much access to help and health here. Like we have very lucky people. Um, And I know that about 50% of our listeners on this podcast are in America. So I'm going to make sure that we have resources for you too. But if you are feeling like you are yelling too much, you are hitting too much, it's not your fault. Mm -hmm. And it's not your parents' fault either. It's Mm -hmm. a Mm -hmm. snowball effect of generations and no one is to blame and everyone can change their perspective. Your parents can change their perspective and their approach and so can you. And that means that your child is going to benefit. So even if you've gotten divorced, even if you've been to jail, committed suicide, had some kind of mental health issue, 
even if you've spanked your child, yelled at your child, uh, done any of these things, it's never too late to turn it around. And I'm going to bring in attachment theory here because yes. it lines up perfectly with ACEs. So in attachment, uh, there's something called negative life events and they are literally ACEs. They are the same events. They just are a separate term. And I've been teaching attachment theory forever. And one of the essays I used to get my students to do was to talk about whether attachment styles are stable from infancy to adulthood. Mm. Mm-hmm. And this is a really contentious topic and it was a big debate for a long time, but we know with pretty, like we know with certainty now that attachment styles change over the lifespan and they are really affected by negative life events, but they're also really affected by positive life events. So even if a child experiences Ooh. a bunch of negative yeah. life events, divorce is always one of them. Um, mm-hmm. Their attachment style might change briefly as they're in this um, stage of fluctuation and emotional unrest. But if you then get back on your feet and provide your child with a consistent, loving home, a co-parenting home, if you are constantly working towards something better, that child can grow up to be a very happy, securely attached adult. It is literally never too late. And Candice, you looked like you were very excited to say something when I brought up attachment theory. So please... I was going to ask you to talk about attachment (laughs) because I wanted to talk about rupture and repair because that is like, I think the most uh, missed thing what I'm seeing on social media with the whole respectful, gentle approach where it's, we mess up and it's important for kids to see that we aren't perfect Mm -hmm. and we're going to struggle. If you don't struggle, you've got something like, you probably have something wrong, like, that's not normal it's not normal to only have like a level human experience because that's not the human experience we have peaks and valleys and they need to see how to overcome a valley and i'm so happy you talked about that that's perfect and i completely agree with both of you that this is so important to talk about and i i'm so in favor of the idea of spreading the the messaging around rupture and rupture and repair Um, And it kind of taps into, I did a post a while ago that was really well received about, um, I just want my kids to be happy. Of course, we all want our children to be happy. But more than that, we want our children to be able to cope with unhappiness. We need our children to learn and know how to manage feelings of frustration, feelings of sadness, feelings of anger, which is why rupture and repair is important. Because when we rupture, so when we there's a disrupt to our relationships with our children, with our partner, with, with whoever, that's not the important part. The important part is the repair. We're always, we're all going to snap. We have moments of frustration. We have moments of, ah, why did you do this? But the, the important part of that is what do we do afterwards? Do we come to our child and say, look, I'm really sorry. I lost my temper and I shouldn't have yelled at you. What can I do to make it better? Or, do we ignore it and pretend it never happened and hope they forget? They might forget, but <laughs> let's let's not let's not do that because you wouldn't do that with your partner, or maybe you would, but in which case, <laughs> let's rethink that. But yeah, it's all about rupture and pair is important for us as humans to kind of maintain and uh, solidify our relationships, and that includes the relationships with our children. And when we do it regularly, we're teaching them the strategies of how to maintain healthy relationships. We're teaching them that when you make a mistake, it's important to own up to it. And that doesn't matter if the person you're owning up to is 35 or five or three. Mm -hmm. Like we're all people and we deserve respect and we deserve to have our emotions and our experiences validated. Absolutely. And I will say as, I mean, I am not um, an expert in attachment by any means, but it's something that I've been increasingly more passionate about as, as you both know. Um, It's something that I practiced when my son was an infant, like just from the start, because when you have a child, as a lot of people know, a lot of things come up, a lot of feelings come up. And I knew like for him, for me, it was the crying that just was the first trigger for me. (laughs) There's so many more, right? Well, (laughs) maybe not for everyone, but for me. So I'm happy. I knew that I was like, wow, I'm really triggered just by a a cry. He needs me. Like that's all he's, he's crying is communication. So like rationalizing what it is. And I started practicing then, like when I would find myself dysregulated, I would just take a step back, take a few breaths. And I'd say, 
okay, I'm ready to help you, buddy. And, you know, if I did snap or something, I'd say, like, I'm sorry. And it sounded so silly. Like, I was apologizing to a, an infant, a newborn sometimes. And it just, it's, it, I think it's just, like, these silly, like, little, you feel like it's a silly little thing, but I, it's helped me so much now. I mean, of course, I still snap. But I feel like my husband and I both have, because um, he thought I was silly at first, um, but it has helped us like mm-hmm. be able to offer co-regulation more regularly than I think we would have. So I just don't think it's ever too early to to start, um, especially if you if you notice those feelings within you. You know, it's it, it's important to address them and just practice. I mean. Mm. but what's the worst that can happen i mean you're gonna mess up apologizing i'm sure too but um you know just gonna just gonna start doing it and it'll be like a snowball effect right makes it easier a little bit a little bit easier each time yeah Um, and this is so powerful because you're not just keeping yourself in check and showing your child that you're mm -hmm. human you are modeling how to regulate and acknowledge when you are feeling out of control so your child Mm -hmm is now watching you and knowing, oh, mum does that. So when I'm starting to feel out of control, I know that I can step back, take some breaths, take some time. And I have a really underdeveloped prefrontal cortex, so I probably need some (laughs) help. Um, And my mum is always there to help me do that. She's always there breathing with me or rocking me or soothing my hair or putting me in a calm corner, doing something, helping me. And they are watching you every time you do it, you are reinforcing that this is how we cope with things that are overwhelming. One, it's okay to have those feelings. Two, you are okay under all of those feelings. You are still you and you are still okay and those feelings will pass. And this is what we do when we're interacting with other Mm -hmm. people. So you're doing some really beautiful things for your child. And it, it's not just keeping you in check and calming you back down and not and respecting your child and not blaming them for your emotions either, but you're also mm-hmm. teaching them how to cope with their own emotions. And that is one of the most powerful things we can do as parents is emo- raise emotionally resilient and, under- and intelligent children, which is something that we were all raised in a different era before we understood this. So this is something that we didn't know. So I'm really Mm -hmm. excited to see what this generation of children grows up like, to see whether mental health (laughs) kind of goes down on the decline in terms of illness, uh, whether Mm. there is just this more open and accepting world. But yeah, it's very powerful what you describe. Yeah. And hopefully we end up seeing other long-term health outcomes like depression and even cardiovascular disease. Mm. I I mean, there's so many things, cancers, um, substance use disorder. Like I said, there's so many things that... um, you know, this affects. So it's, we're laying the foundation for a healthy life really um, from infancy. So. Absolutely. so yeah, I think that I talked about everything that I had and I'm always available. Um, if you have any other questions. <laughs> Amazing. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Candice. That was a beautiful episode and it, it's really a foundational thing that we want to talk about in terms of parenting and you've covered it so amazingly so thank you for joining us and taking thank this you. time all right oh, thank well, you guys <laughs> um, if you want to find candace on any of the social platforms she is at sleepy mama says on tiktok i'll put it on the show notes anyways and your candace <laughs> st john on instagram and your yes. website is candace st john dot dot com, com. <laughs> <laughs> the American way. Um, I'll put it on the show notes. But thank you so much for joining us, Candace. Thank you, guys, and I hope that you have a wonderful morning. Morning, Not yes. Day. <laughs> well, we hope you have a wonderful night. Thanks. <laughs> yes. All right. Bye. Take Bye, care. Candace. Bye. <laughs> There we go. We hope you enjoyed that episode with Candace. Um, we were very excited to have our first guest, and she was a wonderful um, first go for us. Um, we loved talking to her, as I'm sure you could tell throughout the episode. So all of the resources that we talked about in the episode itself, um, the number story, as well as risk and protective factors for ACEs, you can find in the show notes. You'll also be able to find all of Candace's handles there. Um, she's on TikTok and uh, Instagram, and she has her own website, candacestjohn.com. You can find all of that information in the show notes. Uh, In the meantime, we hope you have a wonderful week, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.